Welcome to Better Leaders, the podcast, where we surface good leadership and smart management in media and beyond. Today, I'm talking to Federica Cherubini, Director of Leadership Development at the Reuters Institute. My name is Anita Zilina, and I'm your host. Welcome to Better Leaders. Federica, it is a pleasure to have you here uh, in the podcast as a guest. Thank you for making the time. Thank you so much for inviting me, Anita. So we are going to talk a little bit about um, leadership, management, change in organizations, all topics that you are deeply passionate and very savvy about. So I'm super excited about that. And I thought um, that maybe for the few members of our audience who don't know you yet and who are not familiar with you yet, could you very briefly explain what you're doing right now and what it has to do with leadership uh, and transformation in media? Absolutely. And I'm sure there are many um, who don't know me. Um, so I currently work for the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism uh, at the University of Oxford. Um, we're probably most known for our digital news report and our research on audience news consumption. Um, we're also very well known for our fellowship program. Um, so where journalists can come and spend between three and six and nine months um, to research something that's relevant to their, to their job. Um, and then the part that I lead is um, everything for um, newsroom leaders and managers and editors and executives and CEOs, really to create a space for them um, to have confidential conf um, conversations about what works, um, what doesn't, informed by our evidence-based research, um, but also bringing speakers and, 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 and experts um, into these settings so that um, you know, they have a settings in which they can learn from each other Other, create a network, a peer support network, um, and sort of like unpack some of the very complicated um, questions and challenges that everyone who's in a position of making some choices um, in the media uh, these days um, really, really face. Um, Alongside that, you know, you mentioned leadership, you mentioned management. Um, we also have a specific program um, for people who are new to management on what does it mean to be a manager and what are the essential skills of a manager? We know that um, in newsrooms, uh, not often there is a, a full appreciation, let's put it that way, for how being a fantastic journalist um, doesn't necessarily translate to be a good people manager uh, and how that is a challenging job sometimes, or at least takes up a lot of time. Uh, and there are specific skills, um, whether it's to give feedback, um, how to have difficult conversations, but also very practically, right? If you're someone who's uh, had a sort of like pretty individual uh, based job as a, as a reporter or as a correspondent, even if you, you know, work collaboratively with other, it's very different when you have to start to learn how to um, manage your own time, manage your time in relation to others. How do you fit in? In all the one-on-ones you have to do? How do you to learn? You do learn to go from the day-to-day -day kind of routine to the big thinking and strategy thinking. So we also have this um, as one of the things that um, we offer uh, and um, to really focus on that. Yeah. Before that, so I got to this job and with a series of sort of like Weird jobs, or weird job titles, maybe not jobs, but job titles <laughs> at least. Um, I was head of knowledge sharing at Condé Nast, which at the time was Condé Nast International, which was part of an international team outside the US, working from markets with, you know, across the world from Mexico to Japan, um, to India, to Germany, France, uh, and others, um, really in a role of like, digital transformation. And I was really focused on. Again, so like the ways that the teams work together, the way that we were learning. So really different roles across my career focused on creating spaces and opportunities for connection, learning, sharing, and sort of like advancing through some of the problems that the news industry is facing by sort of like putting together <laughs> creatively multiple minds to find, to find creative yeah. solutions. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. So many things we can talk about. We can also uh, rename this podcast to people who had the weirdest job titles. Uh, 
talking to each other about the industry, but we'll we'll table that for now and and focus more on the leadership and management part of things. One thing uh, that I'd be really curious about now, you've had this job for I think five five six years, right? Um, it's three years actually. It's like it's a pandemic, so it feels oh, like it feels it feels like <laughs> ten years. Yeah, yeah, three years, which is kind of thirty uh, real years through a pandemic through like changes in the industry through now an emerging crisis i'd be really curious to know on a high level what are some changes that you're seeing in leadership uh in the traits and skills leaders have but also in the traits and skills you think leaders need yeah i mean i think um Uh, you know, not necessarily super new, but I think since the last three years, there is a higher and sort of like bigger awareness that um, some of the traditional skill set of being a great um, editor or a great leader or a great newsroom manager um, mainly just focus on your domain expertise, whether that's editorial or whether it's business needs really to be complemented by a more sort of like 360 approach, right? So even if you're not directly responsible for the business part, you can't really be a top editor without understanding how the business work, because that really also um, reflects onto what kind of audience strategies do you have? Do you, are you really serving your audiences, which is truly really a concern for uh, and a question that is on everybody's mind, right? But that also has a, an, an extra layer if your publication is advertising based or subscription based or membership based. So those understanding, um, you know, this well from a lot of your roles, uh, the product component, right? So it's not just about what kind of journalism um, do we produce, but how do we distribute? Mm. But also what kind of user experience uh, a user had in, in an environment where there is so much competition for attention in the first place. The type of um, experiences we have online also have an impact on our, um, you know, uh, ability or just like willingness to spend time with, with products that not necessarily fit what we are used to in other spaces. Um, so product and, and audience and, and business and technology. So basically kind of tr new traits or new uh, interdisciplinary Definitely new function. Curiosity about some of this stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. Used, like ChatGPT and all generative AI, like at least understanding mm -hmm. what, how things move. Mm -hmm. But I think from a, from an, a, a second layer, um, also much more attention on the people aspect. Um, and, and that means how to create inclusive um, cultures, how to create a culture in which um, your teams are thriving and feeling that they are learning. Um, so in a way, a sort of like a focus on a bit of intentionality, adding a layer of intentionality to some of these things that, um, you know, we just used to focus so much on on the journalistic product without necessarily thinking about what is the operational support that we need to make these things happen. Uh, and, you know, always sort of like, in a way, maybe thinking that those things are less important and either because of like soft skills and, you know, it, no one that needs to like you necessarily to be a good leader, but that's not really what we're talking about, right? We're not just talking about it, the people like me, like how as a leader am I creating a situation and, and, a, and an environment in which the team is thriving and can do their best work. Hmm. Um, and it has also some implication about, you know, communication and transparency and how we talk about things and who is part of this team, right? Diversity, but also not just how does the team look like from the outside, but within the diversity, is it really representative? Is it really inclusive? Um, so all of this are like layer of beyond the domain expertise that had to expand. Um, also this like other skills Maybe in other industry, um, would there like always be a recognition that some of these were really important? Um, Interesting question, right? Interesting question, because that's one of the things that obviously it's always, you know, you, ha you have a certain tunnel vision, not you personally, but everyone has. If they spend most of their time in an industry, 
you keep asking yourself, and that happens to me all the time, is that weird? Or is it, is it just me who thinks that's weird? Um, is it our industry that's behaving different than others? Is the media industry more resistant towards implementing deliberate, conscious, diligent leadership and management practices than other industries? What, what is your perspective on that? I don't know if it's necessarily the news industry is, is worse um, or, or, or better. I mean, I don't think better, but um, not necessarily <laughs> worse than, than others. I think there is a bit of, um, I wanted to say the word excuse, but then it's also not an excuse. Like It's a reality. Like It's, it's a fast-moving industry. Um, a lot of um, the time is... Um, time, you know, the work is time sensitive, like things move fast and news needs to get out. And there are so many things and so many changes. It's very easy to get fully into the day to day and don't really creating that much spa space for reflection. Um, and so I think in a way, um, it's probably normal that we don't really have that much time. I was like, oh, everyone stop and so it's the rhythm the news the rhythm, rhythm that makes it hard the rhythm, but i think also in a sense like maybe what's changed in the last three years and we are having some of this conversation much more as an industry as a community that talks about media that thinks about media and there's a bit more of a sense of urgency um of um, we have to address this if we think about the level of burnout that and, and mental health um, issues that we've seen popping up in the industry, or at least maybe they were already always there, but we're talking about them more. We're talking about um, diversity and, and representation and inclusion more as something that is really important. Now, not necessarily just talking about it doesn't necessarily mean we're doing something about it, but I think there is a bit of a uh, of an uh, awareness that these are mm -hmm. important things yeah. that will, in some cases, make or break um, an organization. And there is not much time not to think about mm -hmm. this. What I always find quite striking is how, how far and extensive the range is from, you know, in the industry, from organizations that really, truly at least try to prioritize culture prioritize, you know, respectful communication, diligent um, leadership, equity, inclusion, and belonging to the ones who are really not just not there yet, but also are really, you know, behaving in a super detrimental way. So I'm always kind of negatively intrigued would probably be the good word by the fact that there are still there is still that huge wide range so in my personal in my feeling we haven't kind of reached that minimum you know that minimum kind of table stakes point of this is not negotiable there is a certain level of respect you have to treat your people with uh, there is a certain level of empathy there is a certain level of diligence there is a certain level of um equity um uh, and the focus on belonging that you just have to have if you want to play in the field of quality news or media organizations i still see outliers on the positive end but i also see outliers on the negative end my first question is do you see that as well? Do you experience that in your work since you work with so many different countries, organizations of all sizes? And then two, if you do, how do we, how do we tackle that? How do we ever kind of reach that, that base level of understanding of this is who and what we want to be as an industry? I mean, um, yes, I do see that. I think maybe I am um, lucky in that sense because, um, you know, through the programs we host and through the conversation we have, um, you know, I get to see maybe 300 newsroom leaders a year, but in a sense, those are participating to this conversation in a way have at least um, understood and, and recognize that it's a conversation worth having. So maybe they, they already sort of like have taken the first step. Um, so that maybe doesn't mean that their organization fully embraced that. Maybe they're at the beginning of the journey. Maybe they are the one that think about it and have colleagues that don't and or operate in a culture that don't. Um, but my way of like tackling that is um, the hope um, that by really working on an individual level. So like, as I said, like, at, you know, our, our events are for like, for example, like, 
15 people, right? So, but, but by acting on that level of the individual, then equipping them to be able to go back to their newsroom and do some sort of work of, um, you know, um, sharing these ideas and, and finding for supporters and finding ambassadors for, for these ideas so that we can hopefully have a more systemic change. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about while you were talking is that in some And this, I think, varies pretty much like country to country or culture by culture. There is a bit of a difference on where the awareness is on the spectrum of of this change in different countries. But it's more like younger generation who are really pushing for things to be done differently. Now, Mm. that brings a lot of um, challenges and how to deal with that. But for sure, we've seen, at least in some places, a push for... Uh, or at least a pushback in saying, no, this is not fine anymore. We have different expectations, um, which can be from things like work-life balance or or the level of autonomy that they have learned to experience also during the pandemic, which again, many of these things have a positive and a negative characterization, right? I don't want to, I don't want to simplify this. Um, but I think some of these trends of saying, you know, that's not okay anymore, we should change the culture. Um, some of that push comes from some of the younger generation. Of course, that's in some cases, and again, not always, might clash a bit with the view of those that who are currently in charge that maybe are yeah. representative of different generation where some of the values or social norm or social contract of what does it mean to be in a workplace and how to operate and who gets to be in power and wh- how do you behave when you're in power. Maybe they grew up with a different approach mm. to it. And, and in a way, we start to see some of those differences coming up. Yeah. And it does create, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's something that obviously I'm also very interested in and that I personally feel obviously when I, when I recruit or work with or strategize with uh, Gen C or young millennials, and I can feel that different approach towards what is work and what should it mean and how should it be incorporated in my overall kind of life and the meaning of life, if you want to put it in like big lofty words. Um, And then on the other hand, you know, I work with CEOs or with board chairs or with editors in chief who have, who often have such a hard time understanding what they see as entitlement, what they see sometimes as, as disrespect, what they sometimes see as folks not being willing to put in the work. So I do see that there's such a tension in the system and such a huge um, looming cultural conflict. Um, And I I wonder if you, do you kind of work uh, across those lines in in the coaching you do, in the teaching you do? Um, Do you, are there some tactics um, that can help the two sides kind of understand each other better? Yeah, we talk a lot about that. Um, you know, for example, um, we work um, with Lucy Kung, um, whose research around this topic um, is, of course, particularly interesting and, and relevant to, to the conversation. Um, you know, for for the book um, about hearts and mind that she wrote um, a few years ago, she really looked at some of this uh, of this issue um, and really. You know, she identifies some of the things that younger generation um, really um, push for or, or want is this feeling of really putting their values first um, in a much stronger way. Uh, and whether it's about um, compromising with what the company value is or their own value, they might tend to choose their own um, value in a stronger mm-hmm. in a stronger way and making less compromises, um, which in some way probably also reflects in some cases of this tendency and again, generalizing, but um, of, of asking, you know, sometimes organizations to take stronger stance um, on, on big things that happen in the world uh, and, 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 you know, say, this is what we stand for. This is our values. Just, of course, it's not how many organizations um, think about their role in, in, in taking a stand. So that could be sometimes a conflict. Um, it's also that in, in my experience, in my conversation, uh, younger generations really have a much more clear sense of 
measuring their progress um, and feeling that they are learning. And so a lot of um, focus on where do I go next? How do I progress? Um, you know, how am I learning? And so in a way, sometimes it's difficult for managers because you know, sometimes you really mm. want to promote someone, but you don't necessarily always have the opportunity just to promote or give a salary rise. Um, and so it's really about for these managers um, finding the time and the space to have the conversation about what is, you know, a personal development plan, for example, and what does it entail that maybe doesn't necessarily reflect or, or result in um, having a raise or having a promotion, but really getting the sense of like, I am learning uh, and, um, but I want to learn fast, um, which again, yeah. that maybe there is a bit of this connect between previous generation where there was a bit more of the sense of like, well, it's a hard way to the top and it will take time. I think that sense of like, it will take time, seems that the time goes quicker um, in, yeah. in some cases and there is more of a of a pressure of saying, okay, what's next for me? Uh, and so that takes time for leaders and, and managers to figure out what is next for you uh, yeah. and and what can you learn while you're here? What are the skills that you can learn while you're here? They will help you maybe get to the next job. Mm. Uh, to this, I have a personal story. For example, um, when I was at Condé Nast, my, my direct line manager, um, I remember I, I just started um, there and we had we were having a conversation about me, my role. Um, and she told me, like, I think really like maybe a month into the job um, to start thinking about what were the things that I wanted to learn in the next year, whether it was like public speaking or something else. And she said straight away, you know, I hope that you will learn these things and use these skills to stay here in this job, in this role, in this company and grow with us. Um, but it's also important for me that you um, focus on what are the things that you want to learn that will take you to the next step, even if the yeah. next step is not with us. And I was a bit taken aback at the beginning. I was like, wow, like I've just started. <laughs> and actually over time, I, re I realized that I was such an important thing to do as a manager to say, mm. I want to support you. Um, you do the work to find out what it is, right? Because I am not telling you what it is. You, you need to put some work in and you need to tell me what are those skills that you want to learn. But I am doing that because I'm investing in you. If that investment pays, you know, back to the company in the sense that you will do that in the company, fantastic. But I'm investing in you as a person. And it really stayed with me over a long time, that sense of truly believing that she was thinking about how I could think about my own personal development. Um, and that was an yeah. important experience that I found really empowering at the time. And it's, it's a wonderful example because I think it does show where the breaking lines and default lines sometimes appear because I think you talked about that social contract before, right? Uh, that kind of unwritten understanding that's not in your work contract, but that you, you know, you and your employer kind of think is in your somewhere, not written in your work contract, but still true. And I do think often legacy organizations see it almost as an insult if someone starts to, you know, to feel that their growth part in an organization is coming to an end, if they start to look at other places, if they urge organizations or their managers to give them development opportunities. I sometimes feel there is this, um, this in the old social contract, there was this understanding of, hey, we pay you money, yes, but we also kind of invest in you by you just being here. <laughs> That's yeah. enough investment. So please be grateful and just stay on board for 10, 15 years. But for younger generations, they're just like, I never signed up for that, right? I, I'm going to give my all for two, three, whatever years. And then when the growth part is finished here, I'm going to move on to someplace else. And I feel that's maybe where some of that tension comes from. Yeah. And also I think, and again, this plays differently in different markets, like different labor laws give different, you know, um, you know, security, security mechanism in terms of, of job. But if we think about it, you know, a lot of this generation is also confronted with a very unstable market. Um, so yeah. you know, there isn't necessarily the idea of like, I'm going to get into a company and be there, be safe, you know, be stable and, and safe for 
X amount of years, I do a lot of movement. We've seen a lot of redundancy, a lot of, of job loss, a lot of switching of roles and strategies and rethinking, you know, uncertainty about how the economic, uh, you know, uh, environment is going to be now, of course, like cost of living crisis, like external things that like yeah. not necessarily are any fault of any organization, but we live in and as a society. And I think that how also adds to this feeling of like, well, if I'm here for a few years, you know, you know, I am investing in being here as much as you're investing in me being here, but I might just get you know, it's going to be hard for me or harder for me than it has been for previous generation to buy a house or to make some of this in, like these life uh, investments, which again, in, in turn, I would understand why someone would feel like, okay, why I'm more transactional in like, okay, what am I learning? What I'm getting out of it? Yeah. Otherwise, if I'm not. Or, or in other words, why should I keep up my end of the social contract if society and the world, broadly speaking, just keeps throwing me curveballs one after the other, right? Or if, you know, it's not really secure that how long I will be able to mm. stay here. And again, like it varies in many different countries. But I think, um, especially I think in the past for some big brands, they had on their side the big brand, right? So you want to work for this very accomplished and, and, and mm. you know, quality, authoritative, big brand, news organization, that's already quite, uh, I don't want to say the world privilege, but, you know, that's already quite s something. Um, and I think now there is a bit of a pushback on that side. It's not really necessarily enough uh, anymore in some cases. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your, your personal leadership journey and your personal kind of approach to leadership, because what I find truly interesting, and there is a lot of, there are some similarities in our, in our careers and our, I think, approach towards leadership and maybe life in general, where at some point, you know, I decided at some point I loved working in organizations in large management roles, but I just realized that I'm, that I enjoy working with organizations or with leaders directly one-on-one -on -one, in consultancy work, in teaching, in advisory and so forth, more than I do working somewhere inside the hierarchy of an organization. So for me, that was part of my, my reason of first starting the, the, the gig at CUNY and then starting my own company that's focused on these topics. What were some things that you learned about yourself in your career, about what you're good at, what you enjoy, but also maybe what you're not so great at. Yeah. I mean, um, I think I've done some of these jumps between working for an organization that supports journalists and journalism. So on the outside, as in like infrastructure to support, um, I started as an intern working for Wanifra, the World Association of Newspaper. Then I went into uh, a news company, then I went out again. So like, it's a bit of like in and out, but I think, um, as, as you, and I remember we were having like a lot of these conversations years ago um, about, about some of these topics and, and leadership and, 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 and the importance of really thinking about this. Um, what I think I struggle is that, um, and this might be like relatable for people that have some, some like hybrid profiles, right? I always knew I wanted to work in journalism, but I was never a reporter. And I knew it from the beginning, like I don't, I don't do journalism in the way that in, you know, my head means to work in journalism. And so I started to like trying to figure out what it is that I can do in journalism if I'm not a reporter, if I don't write or produce video or do storytelling about what's happening in the world, how do I support it? Um, at the time, especially in Italy, there wasn't very much a lot of focus on, you know, the product roles or the audience role that kind of like started emerging later. But I think what I really took me some time in my career to realize that I was a generalist um, and I knew a lot of things about how, you know, the thing stays together, <laughs> like how the full machine run, knowing enough of different languages and disciplines and things to kind of put them together and to put them in a connection without never being like the ultimate expert about that topic. Um, and I felt for a long time that was a weakness um, because I was good for, to me. It, I was good at 
many things, but actually I always ask myself, like, people, what it is, right? What is your job? You know, we mm-hmm. joke about weird job titles, but I think, um, you know, even when I when I was a content artist, which I had like this like job that could that could touch with a lot of uh, different teams, and I loved it, right? And but if you probably went and asked people, um, my colleagues, about what did I do, you could probably get like twenty five different answers because I was like having so many different hats, and really a lot of my work was in this connection between different parts of the company and saying, wait a second, like we're doing the, we having this conversation over here and we having this conversation over there It's joining up and, you know, we can learn from that. Uh, and, or, you know, conversation saying, wait, we, we're missing this voice or this part of the conversation and they will know something that will help us get to the, to the finish line. And so I started realizing that that ability of actually seeing multiple pieces at the same time and knowing when to to say, I know enough to understand this, but we need the expertise of that person who's really the expert in this and they will know better about this. So, and then really pulling in the different expertise to get things done. Um, and that was really a realization it was like, actually, this is a strength and this is a skills in itself, um, this ability of, of, of understanding at a systemic level how things work, then going deeper into like the the specificity of some of it. So like com- continuing like zooming in and out and and making that connection and and being an enabler, being a connector. Um, and I felt for a long time that those were like sure useful skill to have and sure everyone likes me and thinks I'm useful but like what is it yeah. like what it is my role in itself like and then I started understanding it that that is if in its apply to really creating situation for um for people to learn and 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 to and, and to connect um then it could be really valuable and then actually that is an expertise and a domain expertise in itself right um because um, more and more, we need to work in a very um, collaborative way where multidisciplines, um, you know, need to come together and have and know how to talk to each other. Um, so then I realized that I was a strength um, and I realized that, um, yeah, being on a, in a role where I can enable some of this conversation, where I, I have um, the expertise or the knowledge of saying, well, this is a piece of research that will be relevant to you. And this is a person you should be connecting with. And, and this is a, a case study that you can use that has happened and worked in a different context. And these are the lessons you can use. Um, just really give me a lot of joy. Uh, and so I really see that, that as that was really nice. So like, the, the thread across my career. Um, but it took me a, a, a bit to realize that I was actually a strength. And it was done on, on purpose in a way because it really reflects some yeah. of my of my skills. And you know, you asked me at the beginning, what did I see changing in terms of of leadership? And I think what maybe needs to 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 really we need to keep thinking about that is that ability that no one leader can be everything for everyone at all times. Right, um, you can't be, know know everything. You can't play all the roles. You can't have all the personalities, and so the ability of saying really, for like a self uh, uh, awareness journey of saying, okay, this is what I'm really good at, and this is where I'm not good at, and this is where I need to make sure that as a leader, I have people on my team that that support me in that and they excel in areas where I don't because we'll be stronger together. I think this is this is a difficult um or like a long journey um where you get to the point where you really understand or have the time to really think about, okay, this is really what is my strength. And this yeah. is where I either need to learn something else or get extra support from from people to work with me um, to make sure that we're strong in that area as well. Mm. And I think that's a, a, a beautiful kind of learning journey that you described. And I think for, I think the difficult part for many people and many leaders and managers uh, going through such a process is, um, you know, that questioning the way you did things just sometimes hits very close to home, right? Uh, just like you, I spend a lot of time with senior leaders who have 
led organizations the same way for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So it almost feels like a, a, a loss of personal identity for them to take that step back to reflect. It almost feels like a, have, having to question their own, uh, you know, their own deep inner beliefs uh, to go down that route of saying, well, that's not about me. But maybe there are some things that I should delegate and maybe there are some things that are changing about leadership. So I sometimes feel that uh, that emotional aspect of, of reflection and questioning yourself that you obviously went through very deliberately and consciously, I feel that's often quite painful and I feel leaders and managers sometimes tend to avoid that pain. Yeah, and I know, you know, it's something that you specifically talk about a lot, this um, need of really leading with empathy and really thinking about um, ourselves, but also um, our emotions and how we show them or not show them, but with intentionality. Um, and, and I think in, in that, um, you know, I was... Um, I was listening to um, one of your previous episodes of this podcast, and um, if our audience haven't hasn't listened to it, um, please go and and, and listen to um, Steely from the Daily Maverick talking about how he went on his own um, self awareness journey and really like how he never really realized um, he says in the podcast that some of the way that he was reacting were coming across in a completely different way of to his team, and so. And I don't want to spoil it too much about the podcast to do, do and listen to it if you haven't yet. Um, but, um, you know, really about the work that they've done as a team to figure out different personalities mm. and different ways of, of showing up to, to problems and, and, and facing those situations, help them understanding that. And I think, you know, surely many organization, do leadership retreats or like away day or those kind of things. But yeah, I mean, I don't know how many really go to that level of commitment to say, okay, let's have a look at this. Let's figure it out mm -hmm. and, and, and see um, how this impact um, the work. Because in a way, you know, it's the responsibility of the leader to create a context in which everyone can do their best job. But that goes through um, being open to change. And as you were saying, it is scary and it is difficult. And it is, you know, if, if you are someone in a leadership position that has been in that for a long time, it could feel quite threatening to be able to say, at this point, I don't know, or I haven't figured it out, or not sure, <laughs> I need to look into this and, and look much more vulnerable if that's not been your style. Um, I can see why it could be really scary. Um, but I think at the same time, as we've seen, those examples of those who are going through it, um, I think they just have much more um, resilient organizations and, and teams. If you could almost wave a magic, <laughs> a magic wand and change some, some thinking and some you know, preconceptions in organizations, specifically media organizations, what thought would you wish to install in them, in them when it comes to leadership and management? Is there anything where, like, if media organizations, broadly speaking, understood this better or focused on that more, their organizations would be better in the long run? I think in part is the idea that this work is very important, but not just because it's morally right to do or, like, you know, you have to do it because it's good to be diverse just because it's good to be diverse. It is, of course, um, but also because it will make a stronger organization. And um, therefore, those conversations about diversity that are very hard and complicated, um, not in itself as, as a discussion, but like, because there are a lot of different levels that you have to pull to be able to get there. There is a question around talent acquisition and how, and building a pipeline, but also to creating a situation in which then, um, you know, whoever you have hired um, feels that they can do, they can be themselves and, and do their best work. Um, we've, we've been lucky to work here at the Reuters Institute with Rama Sharma, who's done um, recently a podcast on authentic leadership and really talks about with a lot of leaders um, really about how 
it's hard to be yourself in a situation where you feel you're not as the majority of the people mm. around you. But I think, you know, again, it's not just about the awareness of why these conversations are important. But I think if I could change one thing is like, it's a long work and it's hard. Uh, and it's easy to feel, you know, to fall into the trap of saying, oh, but I've done one, two, three, tick, 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 even with the best intention, and, and that's going to be enough. No, it's not enough because it needs to be worked on constantly. It's about really increasing the awareness across the entire organization, the entire management team of how do we model this, right? And you can have one very inspiring leader who acts and behave in a very inspiring way. And that's great. And they can serve as an example, but it can't be on one person's shoulder, right? And that cannot be either the, you know, um, someone who's, who's representing different views of different, of different point of view, um, or, um, you know, because that will put so much pressure onto them on having to succeed. Um, but it's also, we can really think that this is something that just individuals can do one by one. Um, this needs to be something that is embraced as a new organization. So the budget one was really be about realize that this is uh, you in for the long game, but it's worth it um, because, because this will really make the difference. So you can have the best strategies on subscription and product and audience and everything. Then the team that is there to deliver is what will make the difference and is what's going to make something, you know, happen or not happen. And we don't really spend enough time. I mean, me and you do because that's the job we do. But like as an industry, we don't really spend enough time thinking that that part is as important um, as everything else. Yeah, absolutely agree. If you could, again, may wave a little magic wand and, and tell leaders about one skill, one trait that you find particularly important in specifically in those disruptive times we live in, is there anything that you would wish to install, yeah? It's, it's going to sound very old school and, and kind of obvious, but um, I'm quite obsessed with communication. Um, I kind of knew you'd say that. What a good answer. <laughs> how we communicate, um, how many things are clear in our head, but not in others. Uh, and so how have we done, have we actually done the work to think about, oh, I'm going to say this thing, does everyone has this shared understanding of what that means? And it won't because information is power in many organizations, like not just in media, um, and information travels in different way. And so, you know, making sure that information flows around the company from the top, if you are the leader, across your management team and your leadership team, but also across the entire organization. And is there an understanding of what we're saying? What is the expectation? And have we talked about that? Mm. And I think in so many cases and like, and, you know, some is just like a constant communication. Some is like, what is the process that we have to keep track of this stuff? Uh, you know, very practical, like in meetings, like if in hybrid meetings or, you know, if someone misses a meeting, like where are the notes of the meeting? Can people find those information right away? Like it's really simple in some ways. And it felt that we don't really have that much time to go, yeah. you know, I'm not talking about overcomplicating the process, but it's very easy to underestimate how much communication play a role in what comes across of a strategy or not. And that um, act of being transparent and sharing as much as information as you can, not always you be as a leader in a position of sharing everything, obviously, um, but really being intentional about um, what can you share with whom mm. and how can you be as clear as possible, if not always completely transparent um, in what people should expect. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, it's a very important one. Excellent point. We're nearly at the end of our conversation. So I'd love to end uh, with the question I always end with. If you could go back in time, ten, tell little Federica, um, your younger self, uh, something about life, leadership, careers that you could share with yourself, what would it be? I think it goes back to what we were saying before about the understanding that uh, 
my strength and my skill set was useful in itself. Um, I've tended to sort of like compensate um, for that of that fear of not having a strong profile in one sense of the other um, with this idea of like, but then I have to be very helpful. I need to be very useful. I need to get everything done. So I'm always the person who will get things done because I'm just like, I always tended to overcompensate with fear of like, oh, they might not remember me because I have, you know, she's a person who knows about X, Y, Z, but they will remember me because she's a person who like, oh, she got that thing done. Um, and I think I like that of me. I like being, <laughs> I'm a practical person. I love to get things done. Um, but maybe I would tell myself that that's not because um, I didn't have enough of a clear profile. Um, and that in a way, also like, our industry is changing so much. Some of these movement and some of these changes will come, right? And so it's fine for sometimes to sit in a role where it's a bit undefined and it's a bit unclear, um, but it will get clarified um, if you do that work on yourself and, and really invest in, in what you can add to the conversation. Um, hopefully it will, it will be enough. Wonderful advice. Uh, Federica, it was a sincere pleasure having you here as a guest. Thank you so much. Thank you to you, Anita. Our conversation has always been very inspiring for me throughout the years, and, and this one was no less. Thank you so much. This was today's episode of Better Leaders. If you enjoyed it, please do follow us and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Missing Link.